Forum. Um, my name is Pam Solo. I'm the co-director of the Cambridge Institute, one of the organizers of uh, this symposium and the forum tonight. I'm also the Bunting Peace Fellow at Radcliffe uh, for the coming academic year. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session tonight, Trinity and the Moral Responsibility of the Scientific Community and the Bomb. Uh, this is the culmination of a day-long symposium on this July 16th, the 40th anniversary of the first nuclear weapons test at Alamogordo, New Mexico. Today we've been looking at the moral and social implications of the bomb, and tonight we'll emphasize the scientific responsibility in the bomb. These symposiums and the session tonight here at the Oracle Forum have been organized in cooperation with the Harvard Summer School and the Kennedy School of Government Institute of Politics and the Cambridge Institute for Alternative Policies. Uh, the forum format tonight will follow the traditional ARCO forum uh, routine, which is to have uh, the main speaker speak for some 15 minutes, followed by uh, comments. Tonight, Professor I.I. Robby will be the keynote speaker with uh, Dr. Jennifer Leaning and uh, Professor Everett Mendelssohn uh, responding. At the end of the uh, forum tonight, we will have uh, closed the forum with a, a reading from the poet Denise Levertov. So we'll close that uh, part of the evening's program and ask Denise to uh, come forward. This is uh, a sober anniversary that we mark uh, today. It's one in which we not only just remember or recall, but in which we try to come together here in this setting to actively engage in the process of reflecting to define our dilemma, and to reinvigorate our ability to choose alternate paths to real security. The forum then tonight is part of an ongoing process that's been going on in our society uh, in the last several years, in part through the efforts of the Freeze Movement and a number of other organizations that have been trying to bring these issues of the moral and social crisis of nuclear weapons uh, to our attention and try to interject that into the public policy. There is a quote uh, that I think sets the context for uh, the panel that we have tonight uh, for the discussion that they will be in, in which they will be engaging. This quote comes from Gandhi, who said these words just after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He said, so far as I can see, the atomic bomb has deadened the finest feeling that has sustained humankind for ages. There used to be the so-called laws of war which made it tolerable. Now we know the naked truth. War knows no law except that of might. The atom bomb brought an empty victory to the Allied arms, but it resulted for the time being in destroying the soul of Japan. What has happened to the soul of the destroying nation is yet too early to see. In a very real sense, that's where we are 40 years after Trinity, the first detonation of a nuclear weapon. Examining what has happened to our soul as a nation, our society, our culture, our systems of knowledge, and to science itself. Surely several other countries have joined this nuclear club and faced similar uh, moral and social crises. But tonight, we look at our own dilemma as the United States. This panel is uniquely prepared to help us reflect on these dilemmas. Let me introduce to you uh, our first speaker, our keynote speaker, Professor I.I. Robbie, who received his uh, undergraduate degrees from Cornell in biochemistry, his doctorate from Columbia in physics, holding honorary degrees from numerous universities, including Harvard, Princeton, Williams College, the Israel Institute of Technology, and the list goes on. He served on numerous governmental commissions and on science advisory committees and serving on the arms control advisory commissions for the State Department. He is a, no a Nobel Prize winner in physics, a winner of the U United States Medal for Merit, the King's Medal of Great Britain, and an internationally recognized scientist, one of the most distinguished scientists of the United States. And more importantly, one of uh, the early voices of conscience in the field of uh, nuclear weapons within the scientific community. 
He's a member of the National Academy of Science, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Physical Society, the American Philosophical Society, and the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. When I asked Professor Robbie what he wanted me to say about his um, background and his credentials, he said, just tell him I, I'm a hell of a nice guy. <laughs> I think that's authentically my impression of uh, Professor Robbie. Uh, we're very blessed to have him with us here, uh, probably the only one in the room who was a witness to the Trinity test and can bring not only science but wisdom to the questions that we face here on this anniversary. Please welcome Professor Robbie. Thank you very much for this fulsome introduction. I'm a, and was a professor of physics. I noticed that professors of English sit down while they talk. Uh, of course, professor of physics, quite different. You have to have a blackboard behind you. So you get accustomed to standing up, and I'll stand up. As mentioned, I'm, uh, I guess, as close to the atomic test at El Magado as a being can be. Oppenheimer was closer, but he was underground, and I was above ground. So I can tell you the whole thing. And I'd like to make my talk somewhat personal. We have all sorts of experts in the panel this afternoon, and I suppose in the audience. They're historians and their theology, theologians, and all sorts of experts in ethics, and historians, and whatnot. So I'm not going to enter into those subjects. I'm just going to tell you of a personal activity which extended for a long time. <coughs> the time of the test, and by the way, if you turn the clock back 40 years, this is about 12 hours, 10 hours maybe, after the explosion. Maybe 11. The, uh, it was after 5 o'clock in the morning on April 16th. And uh, you just have to take it as mountain time. I came down to witness this thing together with Robert Oppenheimer, who was the director of the laboratory. And we drove down from Los Alamos. And you drive through a pretty dismal country around there. And finally we came to a place that looked green. And this is the Gennaro de Morto. So you call this a desert. What do you know about deserts anyway? You're a city boy. Anyway, so there we arrived. It was a real desert, they say. But shortly after we arrived, it started to rain. And it rained cats and dogs. In fact, it rained so heavily that people trying to walk through the desert got these clouds of sand, mud on their feet. Very un unlike a desert. Actually, the bomb was supposed to go off about midnight. And this wasn't just a random selection. An effort had been made, a very careful effort, to predict the weather such that the winds would be whatever currents there were, there'd be a compensating current, so that debris from the bomb would uh, drop on the lot, which had been staked out for it. And the weather prediction was for a clear, beautiful day with the right wind. Well, actually, there was thunder and lightning and heavy rain and so on. <coughs> it looked very unpromising. The question was what to do with a postponement. You couldn't postpone it. 
unless you postpone it for a long time, because the crew, the people who did the work, were the dog tired. So we decided to wait out, and about five o'clock in the morning, the weather was right, and the call came. And I was about 12 miles away to headquarters from, from the bomb. And it went off. There have been tremendous poetic descriptions of this event. The best was written by a General Farrell. And, um, and I won't try to give you the feeling for it. People have asked me how it felt. I have to say that I was scared to death. When it went off, and the light continued and lighted up the hills, and this mushroom cloud went up there, enormous, threatening, it looked as almost upon you. The next emotion was wonderful. My friends at Los Alamos had carried this off and were successful beyond their dreams. The next reaction after that was, the war will be over soon. In fact, General Farrell, who was there, predicted it to be over in six weeks. Actually, it was over sooner than that. Then, a few minutes later, came the really big reaction, which has determined a lot of my life since that time. And that was, what a terrible thing this is. It's a new world. Uh, how will we be able to cope with it? And I actually had the physical goose pimples over it. Oppenheimer had similar reactions. Right after the thing has settled down a bit, and he came back to base camp. <clears throat> from his, excuse me, from his um, bunker. And you should have seen him. He had a real strut, like high noon. Great success. Actually, it was a great success for him because he was the director of the laboratory and more responsible for the success of this than anybody else. Well, that afternoon, we went back to Los Alamos in a very subdued mood. Now, there was this new thing. What are we going to do about it? What's the world going to be like? What's our responsibility? My next step in this talk is to tell you about a week in Christmas, Christmas time, 1945. And Oppenheimer and I were sitting in our apartment on Riverside Drive in New York, looking out over the river. It had been a very cold winter, and there was ice floating on the river. And towards sunset, there was a pink reflection from this ice. Now, what's going to happen? It was clear to us at that point that the best thing in the world, and the only thing to prevent catastrophe, was to make this weapon under international control. And that atomic energy, which then looked like a great promise, again, international control. And a tie-in so that a country which violated such agreements would lose its atomic energy, which would be a vital part of the economy. This was the essence of the plan containing these suggestions. Oppenheimer then carried this into the Washington 
with the, and resulted in the Atchison Lilienthal Report, and then into Baruch Plan. Now, believe it or not, we actually propose in this country to give up our monopoly in atomic weapons, have it under some sort of control, international control. I think it was our finest hour and the only really practical proposal that's been made. Barney Baruch was chosen to be our delegate in making this proposal. He was chosen because he was a well-known reactionary. And, and if we get any success, he might get the thing passed by the Senate. Well, the rest you know. The Russians said no, which was a very rational thing for them to say, to present it suddenly with such a proposal. But we didn't pursue the matter. And after that, the arms race really started. But I'm so proud and so glad that this country, at least, did something as original and as idealistic as that. And let's not forget it when we think about the United States of America and its capacities and its moral capacities. Well, that great vision passed. And a few years later, in spite of uh, predictions, from various people, the Russians always also had an atomic bomb. It was unexpected by most, although some people felt that it could be done. Some of our people were so proud of having achieved this that found it hard to believe anybody else could. But they did. And this question, what to do next? By this time, once the Russians had an atomic bomb, it's conceived as a real threat. While the atomic bomb was being made, there was another, an even bigger idea of the thermonuclear bomb, so-called the super bomb. And this is something which was pressed, particularly by Dr. Teller. Now, once the Russians had this bomb, some people felt we ought to have some response to it. And the response they were after was it would be the super. We would go to work on the super. And with tremendous political skill, They got to be, to be considered very, very seriously. And the Atomic Energy Commission asked us, and um, us by me, members of the, of the advisory committee, general advisory committee to the Atomic Energy Commission, <coughs> of which I was a member, and Oppenheimer was chairman. Dr. Conant, the president of Harvard, was a member, Enrico Fermi, and so on, <clears throat> were called to call together to consider what advice to give to the government at this point, whether to go ahead with the super, which was this thermonuclear hydrogen bomb, or what. And we had some very serious meetings together with the chief military officers. And uh, we decided to uh, advise the government not to go ahead with the super.
And there were two groups. One group, which advised not to go ahead at all, and there was a, a minority opinion by Enrico Fermi and myself for the sake of the Harvard people here I'd like to tell you that Dr. Conan was absolutely against the super at that time and he gave this very clear Yankee opinion he said the world is loused up enough without this. This had a tremendous influence on Oppenheimer. Now we were talking about moral responsibility and so on. So I'd like to read to you the minority opinion recommendation of Enrico Fermi and myself. And could you do that? My eyes are not good enough to uh, read it. An opinion on the development of the super, October 30th, 1949. A decision on the proposal that an all-out effort be undertaken for the development of the super cannot, in our opinion, be separated from considerations of broad national policy. A weapon like the super is only an advantage when its energy release is from 100 to 1,000 times greater than that of ordinary atomic bombs. The area of destruction, therefore, would run from 150 to approximately 1,000 square miles or more. Necessarily, such a weapon goes far beyond any military objective and enters the range of very great natural cat catastrophes. By its very nature, it cannot be confined to a military objective, but becomes a weapon which in practical effect is almost one of genocide. It is clear that the use of such a weapon cannot be justified on any ethical ground which gives a human being a certain individuality and dignity, even if he happens to be a resident of an enemy country. It is evident to us that this would be the view of peoples in other countries. Its use would put the United States in a bad moral position relative to the peoples of the world. Any post-war situation resulting from such a weapon would leave unresolvable en en enmities for generation. A desirable peace cannot come from such an inhuman application of force. The po post-war problems would dwarf the problems which confront us at present. The application of this weapon with the consequent great release of radioactivity would have results unforeseeable at present, but would certainly render large areas unfit for habitation for long periods of time. The fact that no limits exist to the destructiveness of this weapon makes its very existence and the knowledge of its construction a danger to humanity as a whole. It is, necessary, it is necessarily an evil thing that considered in any light. For these reasons, we believe it important for the President of the United States to tell the American public and the world that we think it wrong on fundamental ethical principles to initiate a program of development of such a weapon. At the same time, it would be appropriate to invite the nations of the world to join us in a solemn pledge not to proceed in the development or construction of weapons of this category. If such a pledge were accepted even without control machinery, it appears highly probable that an advanced stage of development leading to a test by another power could be detected by available physical means. Furthermore, we have in our possession, in our stockpile of atomic bombs, the means for adequate military retaliation for the production or use of a super. E. Fermi and I. I. Robbie. Thank you very much. I'm very proud of that document. I think it was a great opportunity to set ourselves right in our own conscience and in our position before the world. Unfortunately, this document never reached President Truman, although it was addressed to him. I learned that only recently. But I had it read to you because it, it goes to the question of this conference of the moral 
and social responsibility of the scientists. Enrico Fermi and I were the only two Nobel Prize winners on the, uh, on the panel, on the committee. And I'm glad to say we took this position, but which aroused no opposition. I also want to point out that there was a, had this very practical side. Not only did we bring up the moral side, but the practical side of the position of this country in the eyes of the world and in our own consciousness. I'll go on to another uh, stage. Um, this was in 1954. President Eisenhower, who was vastly underappreciated by historians and others, became very much concerned about the rise of nuclear weapons, the Cold War, and so on, and proposed that we have some kind of pooling of fissionable material resources. He proposed this at the United Nations. It got great acclaim. And after a few months, the thing died. And the thing was put to us, what to do to keep this idea alive? And I suggested that we set up a conference on the peaceful uses of atomic energy. A large conference that occurred in Geneva in 1955, an enormous meeting, and I wouldn't have the time to t tell you any detail about it, was an enormous success. There were about 2,000 journalists attending. The results were published in many volumes. Enormous sessions about methods the peaceful uses of atomic energy. <clears throat> it forced us to declassify a lot of classified material, which referred to reactors. Altogether, it was an enormous success. For the first time, numerous Russian scientists, Soviet scientists, and, and from the other socialist countries met Western science scientists. And they got along very well. It was remar remarkable altogether. We did tremendous things, unbelievable. I'd like to describe in detail, but I wouldn't have the time. But we flew over a reactor, actually, to the grounds of the United Nations Palais de Nation in Geneva, demonstrate these things. Well, the thing that impressed me almost more than anything else. This was a broadcast to Hungary from Russia by Russian physicists. And we say all these things are controlled, and I hope they were, because he spoke to the Hungarians about this wonderful conference, how warmly they were received by the Western scientists, how warmly their papers, their contributions, were received. But he went on to say, I don't mean to say that we had the best papers or the only good papers. For example, there was a paper by Professor Ernest Lawrence from California, Professor Walter Zinn from Chicago. In other words, there was no trace of this censorship or a man in a totalitarian country speaking under controlled conditions. And that made me feel that there was a lot of hope. But when I came back to this conference, after this conference to Washington, and said, here we've had this enormous success. It received universal attention. We have overshadowed the Russians and the others scientifically. 
What are you going to do next? There was not a single idea. It was just a great thing which was done to show our superiority. But the next step after this, any deduction from it, was simply not made or, or taken. I could go on this way, but I, I won't. But other experiences of this sort. But now, it is 40 years later, we have had this arms race. We have failed, we have given up our advantages we naturally had that made this country what it is because we had no problems of security for the most of the, our existence. We had the Atlantic on the one side, the Pacific on the other side, and the northern wastes to the north. We're rather immune. Apologies to the Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> it's only a thin belt. The, uh, and we are a peculiar country. We are a unique country. But the development of weapons of greater and greater reach, greater and greater possibilities of destruction, turned us and is turning us into a country that's vulnerable as if we were a power on the Euro European or Asian, African continent. We're reachable. And this arms race is making us more and more vulnerable. And I can see the development of this country that we begin to have the reactions of countries under those conditions. I find it very hard to believe that our system of government, our freedom, our peculiarities can survive under the pressures that I'm describing. Pressures which the European countries, one after another, had to turn to very strong central governments. So our problem seems to me is how we can preserve our democracy, how we can preserve our freedoms. I don't think they can survive and you can see the erosion going on in this country of the freedoms which we have come to take for granted. So what we have to do is to do what we can to undo this pressure of the threat of these atomic weapons. How to do it? We have tried now for almost 40 years to do it by negotiations, by arms reduction. And the more we tried, the tougher the arms race has become. The larger the weapon stockpile, the more powerful the weapons than existed before. This is something clearly that does not work. You don't have to be a scientist not to beat your head against a stone wall. We have to try new procedures in order to alleviate this. I stopped going to meetings of arms control and you have one man saying this will kill 20 million people and the other man saying nonsense, only 17. I think that sort of discussion and that sort of thinking is inhuman, it's obscene, it's wrong, but it implies a habit of thought. So pretty soon, we'll become accustomed to think of that. Come accustomed to think of humans as material that can be blown up and destroyed. 
and you begin to think that people who live across a boundary are not, not made of the same flesh and bone that one's own country is. All the human characteristics remain. One loves animals and pets and children, but can contemplate the most awful things for others. And that's a moral obtuseness and a moral degradation that we have to overcome. And now discussions of arms control have not touched that side. We have to bring back a feeling we once had about fellow human beings of compassion and feeling for them. A great respect, a greater respect for human life, for the remarkable, wonderful, glory of a human being altogether. So we have to recover the moral dimension. We must stop thinking of other groups of people as the enemy. I saw this in Germany. Helen and I were in Germany only a few weeks ago. We had been in Germany before. I studied there as a postdoctoral fellow in Hamburg. And we were treated very, very well. We came back 60 years later. That's where I got the basic technique for which I got the Nobel Prize, of course. Nobody who was there at that time was still alive. But one had a sense that there was a tragic feeling in that country. President Truman could perhaps say forgive and forget for what happened in the past. But history doesn't. And you can see that sense of history like the curse of Cain upon them. It doesn't despair. And if you, one destroys a lot of people, one feels badly about it, not just the next day, but for generations. So to save the world and to save ourselves, We've got to bring in this moral dimension, which is rather deep and profound. And instead of talking to the public and scaring them about the results of atomic weapons, true as it may be, horrible as it may be, we have got to go out and awake that conscience of respect for human life a respect for humanity, a respect for the aspirations of humans, and to start thinking of what it would do for us, to us. This is quite well understood among scientists. Twenty years ago, I gave a talk at Los Alamos, about twenty years ago, and the question was, what have the Russians done for us lately? You see, by having Sputnik, they gave a tremendous impulse to us to perfect our educational system. They understood perfectly well what I meant when I said, if not for the Russians, we would be using atomic bombs in Vietnam. And that would have been a sin of tremendous magnitude. They understood that right away, without my saying it explicitly in this way. So what I'd like to see in the message I'm trying to bring to all of you, let us try to talk to the American public and strike this common note of humanity and human feeling and the sacredness of life. Thank you.
I think your response clearly demonstrates um, our gratitude to uh, Professor Robbie, and you'll have a chance to ask him questions uh, in, after the respondents. Our first respondent is uh, Jennifer Leaning, a physician who is Chief of Emergency Services with the Harvard Community Health Plan. Jennifer was one of the uh, handful of doctors who rejuvenated physicians for social responsibility in the late 1970s as an, and has helped uh, developed the physicians movement into one of the most important voices in the arms control and disarmament debate. She has authored numerous scientific articles and is co-editor of uh, The Counterfeit Arc, a leading book on civil defense and nuclear uh, war. She is currently chair of PSR's Long Range Planning Committee and a leading par participant in the emerging debate on national security uh, alternatives and definitions. Uh, please welcome Jennifer Leaning. I think I'll stay. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it, there's a way in which one wants to give some space to feel what Professor Robbie has just said. Uh, and um, I, so I would like to acknowledge that at the outset and then recognize my responsibility to speak um, briefly uh, in uh, the penumbra that he has created. Um, I would like to say that. Uh, it has become increasingly clear to me that we are not raising people in this society to recognize that among the responsibilities of being human is to raise yourself and your colleagues and your children to be moral and to recognize that we exist in a field of moral choice which uh, confronts us incessantly and the extent to which we fail to recognize it does not excuse us from the consequences of the actions and choices we make. Being a physician has fortunately put me in a position during um, four hard years of scrutiny when there were peers and mentors watching the way I behaved in stressful situations who would comment. Uh, you also sort of carried your feelings on your sleeves and you saw the outcome of your actions very directly. And I feel as if I've had an apprenticeship in moral action. And uh, that has prepared me to a very limited extent to resonate with the anguish that scientists must have felt at the time and certainly feel afterwards who participated in the Manhattan Project and all the various scientific committees and work groups that contributed to the um, technology that now oppresses us. And. Uh, without in the least wanting to uh, cross the uh, border of humility that I feel between what they could accomplish and what I could understand, I would like to say that I and all of us here, to some extent, are transfixed with choice in the same way they were. Uh, we are fortunate that the consequences of our decisions are less sweeping and less public. And I think that there is no easy answer to how one behaves in a moral force field. That it begins by recognizing that you're always there. And what frightens me as I move around this country and interact with people is the extent to which they fail to realize that part of being human is to realize that power and knowledge carry rights and responsibilities. And that those with power and knowledge must protect and nurture as well as explore and intervene. And that applies to physicians and scientists, but it applies equally to children when they learn what to do with an ant or a puppy, and to people on the road, and to parents who decide to put their children in seat belts or not to put their children in seat belts. Those are all moral actions. And the extent to which we comment on them and teach, I think, defines the extent to which we 
um, recognize the fact that we are part of an interdependent world and we don't have a lot of time to continue to pretend that we don't. I was recently at a conference in Budapest uh, that was attended by 800 doctors who belong to the International Physicians Movement. I was leading a workshop on physician resistance to nuclear war, a workshop that I've led or contributed to in the last four years. And I now have many colleagues and friends from the European physician community who are in a somewhat more fraught situation because the Belgian, the German, and the Swiss governments are all now requiring some participation in civil defense efforts on the part of the physicians who are natives to those countries. And as members of NATO, they are all subject to the current NATO protocol on battlefield triage of personnel caught in a nuclear, tactical nuclear war. And a Swiss colleague of mine gave a paper at this workshop where he described the ways in which he has refused to go along with the last 17 civil defense directives he has been subpoenaed with in the last year and a half and faces imprisonment for approximately three years sometime in 1985. And he read to me the way in which he is describing his stance within Switzerland, which, as you may know, is, although a non-combatant nation, militantly determined to survive whatever war may await us, and for its 6.3 million people has 5.2 million shelters. He is a subscriber to what is called the Frankfurt Oath, which originated from the International Physicians Council two and a half years ago, and it's a physician's oath for the nuclear age. And I'd like to read it to you because when it first came out two and a half years ago, many of us, both European and American, let alone the Africans and Asians and Latin Americans who are now joining us, thought it was a bit extreme and that it might cause more problems than it would solve, and it might get people's hackles up. But as the uh, months have gone on and the weapons have amassed, and we are now seeing continuing strategies for the use of more bizarre technologies, it seems to me that this oath has um, a real presence for us, and it certainly now has concrete reality for him. So I'd like to close by reading the oath and uh, let you know that there are a large number of physicians out there who are considering signing it. In the states, we don't yet have to sign it. We're not yet in a place where we are facing a line that we can step across or not step across. But there are directors from the government, there are triage protocols, there are decisions about the use of hospital beds, and it's all part of the nuclear war planning psychology. And I think at some point it is terribly important for us to name, race to the surface for the rest of us, and then for those of us who have a particular responsibility in the system that is being created, uh, it is incumbent upon us to say this is where we take a stand and say no. So let me read you the new physician's oath, which is uh, it's an exaggeration to say it's sweeping Europe, but there are a lot of people signing it. As a physician, I recognize that the only effective medical response to nuclear war is prevention. I believe that medical preparations for nuclear war increase its likelihood by strengthening the illusions of protection, survival, and recovery. Such measures promote the acceptability of a catastrophe which I will not accept. As a matter of individual conscience, I will refuse to participate in any medical preparations for nuclear war. I affirm my duty and willingness to provide care in all medical emergencies to the best of my ability. I commit myself to applying my medical knowledge and skills for the preservation of human life and particularly the prevention of nuclear war. Thank you. Our uh, next respondent is Everett Mendelssohn. Everett is the History of Science professor here at Harvard University. He is chair and founder of the Cambridge Institute for Policy Alternatives. He has long been interested in issues of science, technology, and uh, its social impacts. He has served on numerous scientific committees and panels concerned with the arms race and arms control through the American Association for the Ad Advancement of Science and the National Academy of Sciences. Everett's expertise spans not only arms control and disarmament issues, but foreign policy issues as well, particularly those of the Middle East. He has long been active in peace and social change efforts through his volunteer efforts uh, with the American Friends Service Committee. Effort offers an informed and compassionate voice on uh, these issues. Please welcome Everett Mendelssohn.
Thank you very much, Pam. At the very dawn of the age of modern science, one of its prophets proclaimed that knowledge is indeed power, and that to know nature, to understand it, was to gain the ability to command it. Francis Bacon. One of the last words that Bacon wrote, the closing paragraphs of his great inspiration, published only posthumously, reflected back on what was still a nascent sense of achieving power, but one that concerned him. Lastly, he wrote, I would address one general admonition to all, that they consider what are the true ends of knowledge, and that they seek it not either for pleasure of mind or for contention or for superiority to others, or for profit or fame or power, or any of these inferior things, but for the benefit and use of life, and that they perfect and govern it in charity, for it was from the lust of power that the angels fell, from the lust of knowledge that men fell, but of charity there can be no excess, neither did angel or man ever come in danger by it. Bacon was worried. Uh, he sensed that new discoveries were going to be made. He sensed that human beings were going to come into the possession of something which indeed they came into, the ability to command nature to do what humans wanted them to do. And he was worried about human beings and how they would treat their new discoveries. And he had good reason to worry. What he saw emerging was a discourse of power, an ability to describe it, strive for it, organize, institutionalize, and create it through the use of the human mind but missing from the discourse of power was the discourse of responsibility. And in his closing words of his own intellectual life, he asked again that people think of that meaning of responsibility. 350 years later, as we examine the problem, the failure is still there. We've achieved the power, and indeed, many have pointed out Professor Robbie so profoundly, the power to destroy everything that humans have ever built. And we still stumble over how to achieve the discourse of responsibility or to know what it means even to what are supposedly the most educated human beings ever to have come through human history, our generation. Special knowledge. We can reach the moon, we can move out to the stars, but we don't know how to stop ourselves from developing the modes of killing and bring ourselves back into human organization, which stands in the way of that use of our knowledge and our skill. Fear and confidence. These have been two of the spurs that have driven scientific advance and certainly were two of the spurs that, built, that uh, led to the building of the bomb, areas that were explored earlier today. They've been a spur to the arms race ever since. We know the fear of the Nazi potential during the second, the years just before the Second World War and during the war. The fear which led people to do things which in their heart of hearts they knew would ultimately lead to real problems. They said it while they were building it, but they went ahead. Fear drove them on, and with it, a sense of technical confidence, perhaps even arrogance. The fear of nuclear power, nuclear energy, the things that could come from the radiation of atoms was old. The very first discoverer, Pierre Curie, when he received his Nobel Prize in 1906, warned about it. He was confident, though, that humans could overcome it. Others of his age discovering the basic steps in dealing with the atomic nucleus were also fearful. Rutherford, Soddy, all wrote in one part or another of their dresses about that fear of what this power might mean in the hands of human beings. H.G. Wells. Uh, that scavenger uh, in the scientific community of his day in a prescient novel of 1913 called The World Set Free, 1913, just before the winds of August, wrote a novel called The World Set Free. In it, he describes the making of an atomic bomb, his words. He describes its use, and he says the explosions which were created by it <coughs> were so devastating that from that point forward, humans would be fearful of ever going to war again. We find in the writings of many of those involved in that success, and I put that word in italics or in quotes, that success of making the first atom bombs and of using them, a naive hope, somehow the sense that the fear of the bomb would make sure that wars would never occur again. 
the 40 years since those first uses of the bomb have shown how illusory uh, that sense of creating human humanness by fear would be. Freeman Dyson, too young to work in the first bomb project in the 1940s, joined the project later, has been a reflector and critic and somewhat quixotic commentator ever since. He pointed out that in both world wars, history proved that those who fight for freedom with the technologies of death end by living in fear of their own technology. Those who fight for freedom with the technologies of death end living in fear of their own technology. In part, this is where we are today. Having perfected a technology, we live in dreadful fear of it. Something that was supposed to give us security has led us to constant and continuous fear. There's a long history of where it came from. Take my course and you can get it all, but in a short version. Uh, one of the things that I spotted was a peculiar relationship. The 1930s, social chaos, economic chaos, striking Europe uh, and the United States. In the face of this social uh, chaos, there was a new scientific confidence born. If only you would turn social problems over to us scientists, using our methods and our rationality, we could indeed solve social problems. A whole movement grew up in Britain, another here in the United States. Uh, one wag at the time in Britain proposed that the House of Lords be replaced by a Senate of Scientists as a way of bringing this special knowledge uh, to bear. The image was clear. Let us provide for a technological fix to deep social problems. Uh, let science take hold. Mind you, it was done here in good purpose. It was not bomb building. Here they thought they would be revising economics, developing new technologies, increasing new industries. But the notion was clear. We can provide a technical solution to social, economic, and political problems. In some ways, the atomic bomb was just that, a technological fix. Instead of going ahead with the hard and political problems of finding out how to avoid fighting wars or once into them, how to negotiate your way out of them, we instead turned to a new technology. And indeed, having used it to achieve what seemed like victory in that war, we live in fear of it every day since. And indeed, we've expended vast arrays of our financial resources, but even more importantly, of our mental and moral resources in keeping that weapons system going. We've done one other thing. We've taken critical decisions further and further out of the hands of an informed citizenry and put them in the hands of what Eisenhower aptly called a scientific technological elite, which would mean that others had to make the decisions. Not even the president, not even the secretary of war, they were warned at those, at those time, could know enough to make informed decisions about the technologies. In part, at least, we've faced that problem and the dilemmas of it, and we're caught up in it. Uh, the call to a new space uh, age war system, the Star Wars, the Strategic Defense Initiative, represents just that kind of sense. Leave it to us. Let's get the experts to somehow create another technological fix to get us past the one we're in. Robbie put it very bluntly when he said what we really have to do is learn how not to conceive of others as enemies, but to conceive of ways of pursuing conflict or differences between us by alternate means, non-lethal means, non-military means. There is a very real set of problems for us, not solvable through new technologies, not solvable through new science, but solvable through new social invention. And in part, what we look for here at the end of the 20th century will be social inventions equal to, if not greater, than the technical inventions which have brought us the problems we've got today, social inventions which demand the work of an informed citizenry and demand the work of experts. Don't turn toward technique, but turn toward social political solutions for what we want to do. For each of us, there's a critical issue, because it's not only a broad social issue. Every time any one of us who are engaged in gaining or using special knowledge, everyone in this room, everyone in this community, students, faculty, researchers, those who hold special knowledge have special responsibility. The more you know, the more responsible you have to be for making use of your knowledge and avoiding its misuse. I spent last year in Germany, and maybe it was that year in Germany which sensitized me to the fact that it doesn't do to say, I just don't know. I just didn't know. That claim 
is a claim of moral bankruptcy and a claim of intellectual bankruptcy. You can know. You can know and you must. You've got to take the responsibility to it, to do it, and the time to do it before you do the other job. It was that phrase that's often quoted from Oppenheimer and others that uh, when I see a technical problem out there, I want to solve that technically sweet problem and gain my success. Then I'll worry about its consequences. I say we've got to invert that. We've got to ask about the consequences of what we're doing and then ask whether or not the technologies we're creating or have can bring us the social solutions we need. The issue is not only a corporate one, which it certainly is, but it's a personal one as well. Robbie called us to rethink the meaning of being human in the last decade of the 20th century. Thank you. Thank you, Everett and uh, Jennifer. At this point, we have uh, four different microphones. Uh, we have more than enough to discuss, both from Professor Robbie and our, our respondents. I would ask you only to ask questions, make them brief, succinct, and to the point. Uh, I will interrupt if you start making a speech rather than asking a question. Please go to one of the microphones, and, and I will call on you as I see you, either in the balconies or here uh, on the floor. There are two microphones. Please, excuse me, please direct your question to one or the other of the panel. Dr. Rabbi, uh, Admiral LaRocque made a very famous statement, which has stuck with me for quite some time. And he said, the enemy is not the Soviet Union, but nuclear war. And I wonder uh, often why we don't see people, especially the intellectual leaders of this 